Hi everybody, it's Monday, it's uh, Sarah Jemei Chuva, it's, uh, wow, it is, uh, um, uh, run away to uh, Yom Kippur, please excuse me, I am trying to uh, do three things at once right now, I'm trying to uh, go live on uh, the Tel Aviv International Synagogue site, as well as, uh, as talk to you at the same time, so. Please, uh, uh, you know what, I'm going to, oh, hold on, all right, again, please uh, excuse the uh, delay, and we're off, we are both on uh, uh, Tel Aviv International Synagogue, Sponsored by Rabbi Ariel Constantine and on my live Facebook page. So, hi everybody. I um, hope you're all well. I hope Rosh Hashanah was uh, meaningful and uh, and you're uh, making the appropriate uh, preparations for uh, for uh, Yom Kippur. And I think this may, I'm not sure, this may be our last class until... Rega? Until... After Sukkot, because next week is going to be uh, Erev Sukkot, I have a funny feeling I'll be in the kitchen. Uh, so let's assume that there's no, uh, that there won't be a class, and we will meet after uh, after the holidays. But in the meantime, let's uh, let's get down to business. I want to um, I want to talk about uh, a Mishnah we already discussed. Uh, a while back. We've actually discussed it a couple of times. And that Mishnah, uh, it just, it's just, it's not that long, it's that far ago. It's an earlier part of the Mishnah we're on. Um, but the Mishnah is is one that really um, affected me greatly in light of a request that was made of me a couple of weeks ago. There is a wonderful, an old friend of mine, not so old, but an old friend of mine, Rabbi Elon Adler, from uh, now from Efrat, um, but I knew him from YU, um, asked me to speak last night at at a uh, get together um, at his shul in Efrat. I'm again fixing the other camera um, in Efrat about um, what I learned since last Rosh Hashanah. And the truth of the matter is that uh, it got me thinking. And it made me realize um, a lot of things and gave me a lot of insight in terms of what really has been going on, at least for me and what I think is going on for the rest of the community um, and for the world over the past uh, whew, over the past year and a half. It's hard to believe it's already a year and a half. Uh, and um, one of the things that uh, occurred to me is the importance of community and how we have sacrificed community um, by virtue of the fact that we um, have been, spent so much time locked up. Now, we have our little communities. We have our families, thank God. We, I mean, all those of us who have families, uh, we've even had some kind of uh, virtual contact with our our extended families and friends, it ain't the same. And the, um, the isolation has taken a toll. And not only has it taken a toll psychologically, it's taken a toll religiously and spiritually. And as um, somebody pointed out to me this morning in a, at a shir that I gave in Hebrew uh, for the Women's Beit Midrash in uh, Efrat, we have gotten comfortable with our isolation. Uh, maybe it, part of it, I'm sure, is you know, justified or understandable um, fear of the virus. Um, it might be because we weren't able to get vaccinated sufficiently. It might be because we don't like masks. Nobody likes masks. I don't think. Um, at all. But whatever the reason is, it's comfortable. Eh, I don't get dressed. I can be on Zoom. Why do I have to go anywhere? Um, and the question is, how do we, you know, how are we to relate to that? 
What does the Torah say about things like that? So it reminded me, it really reminded me of, uh, it reminded me of um, the Mishnah that we have encountered twice. Don't separate yourself from the community. And I'd like to return, I'd like to revisit that Mishnah um, from a different angle. And I'd like to talk about um, the idea of community. We touched on it um, you know, months ago when we talked about this Mishnah, but I want to talk about it more in depth in, con in, the, context of, um, in the context of Yom Kippur, uh, in the context of our lives, and in the context of the question, uh, is the, it, are we obliged to get back in the game? Are we obliged to go out? Are we obliged to get going? Now, yeah, I mean, people want to go to a ball game. They want to go to a, they want to go to a concert. But from a religious point of view, are, is, is there anything to be gained? Is there anything that we have to do to, you know, get out of ourselves and get out into, into the world? So I would like to, um, I'd like to engage that question um, by revisiting um, uh, a couple of passages from Maimonides uh, that were uh, explained by... Um, my teacher of Soloveitchik, and uh, which I hope will give you um, uh, food for thought. By the way, uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, the um, I will try actually to download and upload uh, my discussion um, last night at um, in Efrat for Rabbi Adler. But for those of you who are interested, he's on his Facebook page, Rabbi Elan Adler, E E L A N, capital A D L E R, and you can go see. Uh, so it wasn't just me. Um, um, a number of uh, very interesting people that uh, participated, and uh, and you can enjoy there. In any event, let's uh, let's take a look. I'd like to start with a um, passage from the Rambam's laws of repentance, the Rambam's laws of tshuva. The Rambam, interestingly, um, in his first chapter, lays out the doesn't really lay out all of the mechanics. Of, uh, of repentance and uh, return and uh, atonement with God. He lays out the theory to a significant degree. Uh, and he talks about confession, then he talks about positive commandments, and he talks about negative commandments, and he talks about all kinds of stuff. Already in the second, but it's kind of odd, already in the second passage, in the second paragraph, I'm going to, I'm going to, I can't seem to find my English translation of Maimonides, so I'm going to translate as we go. This is chapter 1, paragraph 1. The Rambam says as follows. The scapegoat, the goat that gets sent off to, you know, to atone, is killed in the, in the wilderness on the, uh, during the uh, Avoda, during the service of the, of the high priest on the, uh, in the temple uh, on Yom Kippur. The scapegoat, since it is, grants atonement, for all of Israel, the high priest confesses, when the high priest confesses on it, over it, before he sends it off to be killed or to go be pushed down off a cliff, uh, in terms of all of Israel. Hashon kol Yisrael. Okay. So in other words, you don't say uh, Tommy, jo, Tom, Jack, and Harry. You say all of Israel. He says, the Kohen the God puts his hands on the scapegoat and he says, uh, oh God, by your God, by your by your name, um, uh, the, the, your your children, the children of Israel have sinned and they have uh, done all kinds of things. It's a collective third person, third person plural past. The uh, scapegoat provides atonement for all of the sins in the Torah. Everything you could do possibly wrong, you get you get uh, you get your get out of jail free card with the uh, with the scapegoat. Uh, both those that are less severe, those that are lighter, and those that are more severe, the more serious. Whether you violated them willfully, consciously, or by accident. Whether you knew you did them or not, because people sin, you know, without knowing. Everything's covered. Everything, all, everything is 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 forgiven with the scapegoat, as long as you repent it. Which is interesting. How do you repent for what you didn't know you did? Okay. That's for another time. However, if a person did not repent, the scapegoat does not provide atonement except for the less severe, less serious, less weighty sins. Okay. 
Very nice. So what's in each category? So I would have thought, oh, very, very nice. You know, the lighter ones, the ones that aren't so serious. I don't know, you know. He ate ice cream less than six hours after he had meat. I, 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 what do I know? I mean, uh, I forgot to uh, say uh, the prayer. I forgot to say a blessing after eating. I, uh, whatever. I mean, uh, you know, something. Something. It's a sin, but it's not. I mean, uh, not, not, not. It's not one of these uh, dramatic things. So the Rambam says, my says. Well, so what are the what are the less weighty ones, and what are the more weighty sins? So my the weighty sins, the ones for which you don't get, you, you don't get atonement unless you're, uh, unless you, uh, unless you repent, unless you express remorse, unless you uh, do tshuva. Those are the ones with in, that engender, or for which one is pub, punished by either capital punishment or karate. Karate is the annihil. Let's call it. Uh, let's go with the easy way. The annihilation of the soul. Or if you swore in vain, you took God's name in vain, uh, even though even though you're not punished by excision, you, you know, your soul is not put in peril, nevertheless, that's considered one of the uh, serious sins. Um, all the rest, Mushara Mitzvot, all the other commandments, negative or positive, they didn't do them, as long as they don't have karet, those are... Uh, those are uh, those are the easy ones. Those are the ones, the light ones. Are the, and for those, you get you, for that you get a get out of jail free card by um, the just the very sacrifice of the um, of the uh, of the scared cup. Okay, fine, fine. I hope you're all scratching your heads because this isn't fine. Hello, I can I can go and do anything in the Torah as long as it's like like that, that tippy top. Type of a severe uh, uh, sin and get away with the. How does that work? Without repenting, that's a good deal. How how how, how could it possibly work? What kind of deal? What kind of thing is that? Um. Later on, Maimonides goes on and says, "We don't have the temple anymore, so now everybody takes responsibility for all of their sins, and unless you do tshuva, unless you repent, you're 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 cooked." You really don't get it. Okay, that makes sense. But what is this? So, Rav Soloveitchik calls our attention to an interesting comment at the very beginning of this passage. He says that the scapegoat is provides kapara al kol Yisrael. It um, provides... Atonement for all of Israel, except for some really very, very focused, special um, sins. In his book, Al Chuva, I heard, actually heard this from him myself before I read it in Al Chuva, on repentance, um, he points out the following. He says, Jews are basically Jews in two modalities. We're born individuals. We're born individuals. Everybody has a relationship with God. Has a standing, as a whether in good standing or bad standing, bad standing, as a Jew. And we relate to our Judaism as individuals. Simultaneously, we are also born as part of the Jewish people. It's a package deal. Whether we like it or not, we're part of the whole. We're part of the nation. Now, this is uh, a very non-liberal, non-progressive position. Uh, but it's nevertheless built into Torah, built into Judaism. The Jewish people are part of the Jewish people. In fact, the Jewish people as an entity is uh, like a corporation. It's larger than the sum of its parts. It's an independent, um, it's an independent entity, which encompasses all Jews who ever lived, are living, and will live. Now, when it comes to the service in the temple, the offerings, the korbanot, the sacrifices that were offered on behalf of the entire, com uh, of the public sacrifices, were funded, they were financed by 
um, they were financed by the half shekel that every Jew sent to the temple every year. It was collected. They, they would, they, the uh, collection uh, process would start um, before Purim, and the money we had to be, we should be, it was delivered before Nisan, before the beginning of the, the Nisan is also the beginning of the fiscal year in the base in the Beit Hamikdash, and and everybody paid their money. Now the question is, what was the relationship of every single taxpayer from around the world? And we know that this uh, half shekel was uh, was um, paid, was was sent from Jews from all over the all over the world, from Spain. I mean, the ancient times you're talking about big, you know, major distances from Babylonia and from Afghanistan. And Spain and from Africa, ah, wherever it was. How would I define? How would I de- express the relationship of every individual Jew to each of sacrifice, to every sacrifice? Well, it's two possibilities. One possibility is that we're all, we're all partners. Uh, you know, I give my half shekel, so I got. That little bit of every single... We're all partners. We're all partners in the uh, in the sacrifice. Slovenchik says no. No. There, You see from Maimonides, I'll call Yisrael, that the Jewish people as a whole is an entity larger than the sum total of its parts. When everybody paid their half shekel, basically they were paying their dues, saying, I'm part of this. I'm part of this. I'm part of this eternal people that goes all the way back and goes all the way forward and exists independently of all of us. And that's what Maimonides means when he says, Sira Mishtalech Lepishu Kaparal Kol Yisrael, that the, the, the scapegoat, the scapegoat when, when the scapegoat is offered, it's not offered. It's not offered because um, every, single, every single Jew is invested in it. And therefore every has a little bit of it. No. It represents the Jewish people as a whole as an entirety. And if you're part of the Jewish people, God forgives the Jewish people. If you're part of the Jewish people, you are forgiven too. So it's indirect. It's sort of a trickle-down forgiveness. And that's why these specific sins were earmarked, were singled out as disqualifying a person from getting this atonement, because if you um, if you're guilty, if you if you if you if you're guilty of the death penalty, then you are expelled from the Jewish people. If you're chayev karet, you're expelled from the Jewish people. If you violate, if you if you take God's name in vain and you desecrate God's name, then you are expelled from the Jewish people. Only if you repent can you uh, can you uh, be included. What do you see from? You see from this that Jews live simultaneously, both as individuals and part of a larger whole. And that idea is not just a matter of like the, the, the nation can come and demand things of you and so on, but it's an experience, a singular part of our, um, a singular part of our spiritual life, which is built into Jewish daily life. How do I know? How do I know that? How do I know that's something which constantly comes up? So the answer is that that's what happens in Shul. That's what happens in the synagogue. I'm not going to go into the details, but the last Mishnah in um, in, in Tractate Rosh Hashanah uh, implicitly asks the following question. When you go to a traditional service, uh, on Shabbat, in the morning or in the afternoon, it's not true, in the evening, but in the morning or the afternoon, what happens? You pray silently, everybody individually, and then the reader, then the chazan, the shliat sibur, um, repeats it. Why? Why? You have nothing else to do. So there are two opinions. So one opinion is that um, it's just a holdover from the time when, the, before there was Sidurim, uh, there was a before there were um, before the uh, text of the liturgy had been fixed, and people basically had to improvise, and not everybody can improvise, and it still affects. You know, it's still good for today because you know there are people that uh, don't know how to read Hebrew well or don't understand Hebrew, so the repetition of the Amidah was instituted to uh, allow somebody who was proficient to serve as a um, 
representative for those people who couldn't do it, and you know they shouldn't feel they shouldn't feel that they were. Um, what's the word? Uh, that they were um, shortchanged. That's one opinion. The normative opinion is different, and it is that when the community gathers in prayer in the synagogue. Two things happen. Two specific prayer experiences are undergone. Experience number one, individual prayer. Wake up, say what you have to say to God, it's a privilege, finished. When the when the the uh, precentor, when the chazan, when the shlich tzibur repeats the Shemona Esrei, he's not repeating on behalf of any one individual. Rather, when there is a minion, the the entire, the, all those present in the synagogue, including women, so don't let anybody tell you otherwise, meld into something called a tzibur, a community. And the chazan and the, the repetition is the offering of one whole new prayer on behalf of the community as an un differentiated whole, like the sacrifice that we talked about a couple of minutes ago. Those are two separate prayer experiences, individual and communal. And they can only be undertaken, they can only be undertaken with a minion. By the way, the, one, of the, one of the proofs, one of the proofs that the repetition of the Amidah is of a totally different timbre and a totally different quality than the uh, than the individual prayer. The fact that only in the communal prayer can you say things which are called the Lord Yeshiv Dusha. Can you imitate the angels in Kedusha? Can you say Kaddish? It's not a, it's, it's not that I need I want to say Kaddish so I need to say a minion. I need to have a minion. No. The creation of the minion makes it possible and relevant and important for the community as an undifferentiated whole to offer up another uh, quality of prayer to God. If you... Now, um, in the absence, and, and this, this extends to all kinds of other areas, which I can't go into right now. So the Jewish life is balanced between the two poles, individual relationship with God, and as part of as individuals, part of a part of a group, and also as part of a whole as a community. And a community is larger than some of us. So I, I know I keep saying that, but I can't emphasize it enough. It's a totally different spiritual, emotional, and uh, and social uh, dynamic. One of the things that Corona has done is to rob us of that social dynamic. Um, if you listen to the, uh, to, the uh, to what I said last night, I talked about the negative uh, results of Zoom and, uh, and, uh, and uh, interacting with people on social media, because that's the only, way, the only outing we had, and creation of echo chambers and all kinds of other things. But uh, from a religious point of view, we have been robbed of half of our souls, half of our ability to be able to relate. We have lost um, the ease with which we uh, relate to our fellow Jews. In some cases, we've lost the ability to be able to converse, even, common language. Um, so that, <coughs> and, you, and you see from me, but you never at the same time, when you look at the discussions of al Tifrosh Mahatsipur, now in light of that, you understand the emphatic nature of the admonition by Hillel. Don't abandon the community. Because the community is as integral a part of your life and of the continuity of the Jewish people and of the Jewish religion as is your own personal participation. Can't live without it. Interestingly... Um, one, one, uh, I don't think I actually mentioned this when we looked at the mission the first time, 
But, uh, and now we need my glasses. Um, in all of the, um, in all of the uh, discussions of, um, of the, uh, of the dictum, of the admonition by Hillel not to, not to uh, abandon or not to separate yourself from the community, so there are different themes that continue, uh, there that continue uh, to jump up. So, for example, Rabbeinu Yonah in the 13th century says, says, don't, don't leave the community, but rather, when, if you see that the community is occupying itself with Torah and mitzvot and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and, 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 and so on, stay with them. Okay. Worship. Uh, Rashi says, later. He says, no, you have to be, um, you have to be with them and identify with your community um, when in good, in bad times and in good times. Because unless you're in there getting your hands dirty with, as it were, with, um, with, with helping people in, in need and, 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 and being able to touch them and, and, and celebrate with them, then, 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 then you lose out. Not just them, and more. And more. And interestingly, and interestingly, says um, the author. His name is Yaakov Ben Shimshon. Whether he was the son or a grandson in the 12th century is not clear, but it's not really important. That I'm not giving a quiz. Um, the uh, author of the of the 12th century commentary on Perkei Avot is found in Machzor Vitri. Says Ella hishtatefe mehem laol malchut l'taniyotu l'tfila. You have to be together. You have to get out, and you have to be there and active. In times of Trump travail, and getting involved in politics, and interacting with other people, and prayer. A full social life is engendered by being part of the Jewish people. Subsumed part, but a part of the Jewish people. So, those are things you can't do, really, from behind the screen. And it's part of what we. Part of the price we paid, or part of the price that was taken by Corona. <laughs> now today, uh, somebody asked me, and we're coming up to the end. Today, somebody asked me, or observed that people like it; they like being home. You know, I, 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 mean, I get a kick out of teaching from from home. I mean, I don't have to don't have to battle traffic for you know two and a half hours one way and two and a half another way to just to teach for two hours. I mean, it's a little bit silly; it makes me a little crazy. Um, people get lazy, you know, stay in pajamas all day, what happened? So, how do we get past that? What does Torah say about that? So I think, and this I'm going to, uh, and with this we're going to, uh, we'll close. Uh, I think that we can answer that question from, uh, the time that we're in right now. The uh, period that starts at Rosh Chodesh Elul, and that continues all the way till the after Sukkot, the Yisru Chag Sukkot, is really one integrated unit. Uh, the month of Elul leads up to Rosh Hashanah, prepares for Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah runs up to, so, to Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the most intensive day of the year. We are immersed as if in a spiritual mikvah of light and sanctity for 24, 25 hours. And then we go to Sukkot. What Sukkot? What Sukkot? Strikingly, there's a difference of opinions among the rabbis as to what the sukkah represents. So, you know, the normal people say uh, it's a sukkah. The Jews were in, you know, Jews were, <laughs> Jews were in booths. They slept from place to place. They put up the tent, they put down the tent. They put up the, the, the sukkah, they put down the sukkah. That's, that's what we're recreating. But Kiva said no. No. The sukkah symbolizes the clouds of God's providence which hovered over the camp. Oh, really? Well, let's give him his due for a minute. What does that mean? It means, yeah, of course a sukkah is a physical building or an edifice or something. But it means that it, the sukkah symbolizes a life on the outside in which you are enveloped or surrounded by God's presence. It's kind of like you leave the intensity of your kipper. And you're not quite ready to go into the world. So like with training wheels or a decompression chamber, if you have the bends, slowly eased out. You're outside, but you're not outside. You're eased into some kind of a norm, some kind of a, 
what's the word, um, routine. And then what happens to Sukkot is over? Nothing. Nothing. Second half, second half of Tishrei, the last few days of Tishrei, nothing. Cheshvan, blank slate. You're out there, the Torah throws you out in the world, and now you got to go do the best you can. I think that's exactly, I don't think this is drush, I don't think this is a sermon, I think this is a message. The Torah demands that you get out of your comfort zone. Obviously, we don't want you to get sick. But the Torah demands that if you ever have sort of acquired agoraphobia, based on lassitude, because you're home and it's comfortable, you have to get back in the game. With masks, without masks, without masks if you don't need it, with masks, with the vaccines, yes, absolutely. But you have to go into Cheshman and overcome the isolation. And I think that's, if anything, we learned anything from uh, past year and a half. That's the mandate. Not of Yom Kippur. But the mandate of Cheshvan. I wish everybody, if I have offended anyone, or I'm sure I have offended somebody, um, over the past year and a half of these, of these classes, I really ask forgiveness. If I have, please let me know. Write to me, and I would be happy to, really happy to apologize directly and on point. I wish everyone a uh, meaningful fast. Um, maybe there'll be a class next next Monday, maybe not, I'm not sure. You can look at the, uh, Rabbi Kia Constantine will put up the, uh, will put up the announcement. And um, either way, if not, then uh, let me wish you now, everyone, a Chag Sameach, and uh, health, and enjoy. Gemar Chatimatova.